Today, I want to cover uh, a topic that is across the value stream in software delivery. Okay, so if most of you would have been in industry for probably 10 to 15 years or 20 years or 25 years, uh, in software delivery, we usually start from you know, a requirement. And these days, we call it story points, feature points. You know, there are multiple terminologies that comes in. And then we develop the application, we deploy the application, and in between, we do the testing, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, there are uh, certain aspects across the software delivery where DevOps can actually add a value, right? So what I'm going to go through today is that the journey of past four or five years since I took over DevOps, okay, and what are the learnings that I have from that, the things that we have built, okay, and some of the failures, okay, and uh, what are the uh, overall enhancement that happened right from left to right, in the sense that right from the conceptualization of a particular concept and turning that into a requirement, a business requirement, and then the development of the code, and then the testing of the code and the deployment of the code, and how DevOps adds a value in it. Yeah, so this is what I do. I head architecture, engineering, and DevOps in UOB. Uh, I have been in UOB for almost eight years. So when I say architecture, I'm talking about the, uh, the whole paradigm of art architecture, which is business architecture, technology architecture, uh, as well as certain aspects of infrastructure architecture. And then engineering is all about frameworks. We do create frameworks for our developers, as well as we do create frameworks for our business units. Okay, so I work very closely with my business units on the overall business strategy and what is needed from technology with respect to that particular business strategy. So my job can vary from anywhere between a virtual account solution for a business banking customer to a SMTP server not handling the throttling. Okay, so that's why I said, you know, when, um, if you see that, most of my work is around fixing my architectural co contradictions and engineering enigmas. Because every time, whenever uh, we discuss about architecture, there are certain constraints that come from engineering or the other way around. Engineering creates certain risks which actually breaks the architecture. Yeah. I'll go through some examples. Um, then uh, my KPI is to make the systems more predictable and measurable. Okay? Because there is always a TCO involved. In the, in the overall software delivery, the total cost of ownership, how to optimize the total cost of ownership. That has been the biggest job for me, at least for past two years, uh, thanks to the Fed rates. Yeah, there's no, not much investments available right now. And um, uh, there is also this constant exploration of different tool sets and different solutions within the organization to basically um, create some business value, at the same time, increase the productivity and quality. Okay, quality has been paradigm because we are a regulated organization. We are not a fintech. We, under, uh, we come under the regulations of MAS, BOT, et cetera, et cetera. So quality is paradigm. Uh, yeah, um, the, most of our investment is going into quality as well, along with the productivity aspects of it. And um, I come from an engineering background. So uh, first 10 years of my life, I was working as an engineer, working right from uh, Unix shell scripts, uh, Unix system services on ZOS mainframes, and then suddenly I shifted to COBOL, Kix, and moved on to RPG, C, C++, then finally came to .NET, Java, da da da, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, these days, you know, um, the, the software engineers are actually more fortunate because they get so much open source, but when I started my career, that was not the case. I had to travel two hours just to compile my code, okay? So that, that's how it started. The problem that the, uh, comes with that is that when so much solutions are available, okay, we don't know exactly that whether the solutions app for the problem statement or not. So we do test and try. And sometimes we see that, okay, this is the right solution we put across in production, and it blows up. Yeah. Uh, so obviously, you know, uh, based on all my experience for past 20 years and uh, many of the failures, there's always this constant storm that runs in my mind. Okay, whether we need to go for Agile or Waterfall, whether Go is the best language or Java is the best language, and then uh, whether uh, you know, mainframes was better than distributed systems, right? So there's always this constant storm, which you can see in the image over there, gender by Dali, thank you. Okay, so that's exactly what happens in the office. Okay, whenever we discuss a, con uh, a concept, as well, that's what runs in my mind as well, right? Now, some of the examples that I wanna take, I mean, some of the latest examples. So when I took over uh, DevOps, one of the problem statements that I was facing was that my Jenkins was going down every third day. Okay, so what it means is that I had to restart Jenkins. Uh, the first thing, the first solution one of my experts gave me was that we need to just add more CPU and memory. Okay, but when I look at the CPU and memory utilization, it was, memory utilization was really low. Okay, so there was some conflicts within Jenkins, 
And when we went back and saw what exactly was impacting that, it was our branching strategy. Okay, so the main branch uh, was lying down over there, but there are a lot of feature branches which has never merged over a period of nine, 10 months. Okay, and that was creating problems over there. So uh, obviously, you know, there were solutions around saying that, hey, we need to move our Jenkins to cloud. Okay, but when I see that, there was no need because uh, all my infrastructure was pretty good. Okay, it was how we have come up with our branching strategy. Then I also looked at saying that, okay, hey, if, the, if we have so much issues in branching strategy, uh, including me, myself, because I was handling architecture also, I'm still handling. We were promising our business that we are a single code base across 19 countries. So just to give some statistics, I have 300 applications running on my DevOps pipeline, uh, which is deployed across 19 countries, which is across retail, wholesale, wealth, private banking, the whole bank as such. And uh, we are one of the few organizations in um, Asia who have deployed a CI and CD solution for AS400 i series. There is RPG, and uh, now we are exploring for COBOL also. Okay, and there are some architecture restrictions around you know how we can do it. Um, so going back to the problem statement, Jenkins. So that is one of the aspects that I found out, and there were synergies around it in the sense that when I saw the branching strategy, then I can go to my architects. Okay, and say that, hey, you have been telling me everything is single source, okay, but that doesn't look like the thing. When are you gonna merge it? Then there's another problem statement that, I, uh, that came, right? I mean, uh, uh, this was a very peculiar one where my business came and said that, I don't know how many of you are architects over here. Do you have architects here? All right, then you can, you can uh, relate to my problem statement. Now. So my business came to me and uh, they said that, hey, you know what? I want these particular 30 features to be delivered in the next three months. Can you give me a cheaper solution, a scalable solution, a resilient solution within three months? Okay, and I asked them why. I asked them why, what's the reason? Then they took some past analysis and said that every time we come for a project, uh, uh, with a project to the technology, it takes almost six to seven months to deliver. Okay, so yes, this is an opinion. I don't have data or evidence behind it. So obviously they showed me the project plan, et cetera, et cetera. But then DevOps came to help me. So you know, I'll, I'll go through some of those examples later on. Then I, I also had a very peculiar situation. So currently my DevOps team, 30% of their time is spent on responding to queries from the development team. Okay, though we have standard pipelines, we have all the documentations, um, the development team usually comes to us and they send an email or raise a ticket and we need to fix the pipeline, but whenever we, need, we go in and fix the pipeline, we see that it's actually an application problem, the way it has been packaged. So what we did is that uh, we, we came up with our own chatbot, okay, based on Raza framework. So it's an intent-based chatbot, uh, unlike Langchain chatbots, uh, okay, where we can have more embeddings, which we are impl implementing now. Uh, we came up with the Raza-based chatbot and gave it to the developers. The utilization was probably 20 queries per day among 2,500 developers that I have. That means that my tickets never reduced. Okay, so there is a human side to it. The developers today, they don't think on the right-hand side of it. There is a DevOps side of it. Okay, because many things are free and I can show you some data around it, yeah. So based on these examples, I wanna make some statements. Probably most of you guys will be able to relate to this. Okay, so the example that I mentioned earlier, right, tweaking the branching strategy alone can reduce the change related issues by 30%. Okay? And then, uh, you know, it also increases the code convergence by 60%. So, how many of you work in any organization that looks at, you know, businesses running across the globe, but you also need to maintain different instances because of regulatory issues? You cannot have one single platform for all the countries because of, you know, commingling of data, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So over there, convergence is very important because we need to converge the code, though there are different instances running in different countries, but the code convergence is important, else the drift will cost a, cost a lot to the bank over a period of time. Yeah? For every $1 spent on software build and delivery, 30 to 35 cents is actually wasted on some kind of inefficiencies. Okay, what we got is a waiting time. Okay, and it's a huge money. I mean, people who are executing programs, you can uh, understand, or who are managing finances for your projects, you'll be able to relate to this. And there are various reasons behind it, and uh, what is that the DevOps can help me? Okay, in order to optimize that, not to reduce it. Of course, it, it can never be zero, but in order to optimize that. 
Then application profiles is something I love. I'll explain to, uh, to you guys with an analogy. Any organization, organization that we take for any business use case that you have, or any kind of use case that we have, three to five patterns is enough for that organization. Okay, when I say application profile, uh, it's like, you know, uh, obviously the bigger ones like microservices or mini lids or monoliths, et cetera, et cetera. But there is also a business angle to it. For example, uh, an application supporting the digital side of it, an application supporting the uh, back office, an application supporting a workflow, et cetera, et cetera. Each of them is an application profile. And if you combine all of them together, three to five patterns is more than enough for any organization of any size. The only thing is that what is the throughput and uh, uh, volumes that particular application needs to handle, there are some tweakings that can be done. Yeah. Silo teams are okay. You know, waterfall is okay. Legacy code is okay. All we need is standards and how DevOps can help us with those particular standards. Because one of the things that I keep on getting from some of my consultants whom I bring in to you know, look at my overall workflow and say that, hey, what do we need to do? The first word that comes from them is that, oh, you need to be agile. <laughs> All right? I mean, yeah, you know, well, yeah, we need to be agile, but I was born agile, right? So <laughs> anyway, um, and uh, the final point is a bit more important because I do see that there are a lot of sponsors over here. Okay, some of them I use. Uh, some of them I don't use, but 50% of initiatives fail as we end up using wrong solution for the right problem statement. Okay, the reason is that we as engineers are biased. We think that what we use is the best solution. Okay, and then we identify problem statement around the solution. Right, and then we implement it, fair enough, but the people who are gonna face the problem is the people who are gonna run that platform. Okay, because all these concepts of, you know, you build, you run doesn't work in a, uh, a larger enterprise. Like for example, for me, I have 3,000 3, developers, okay, at any given point based on the augmentation, right? Uh, but then I have a separate run team because we are a governed organization or a regulated organization and the run team manages the application that the application team delivers to them, okay? So when we implement a solution, we need to think that who's gonna be end user? Are you, if you are the one who's gonna run that application in production, okay, will you accept that solution? Right, and again, how DevOps helps you know to resolve this issue as well. Are we going through that? So let's just take one example, right? I mean, this is one application profile of microservices that I'm talking about. So whenever we build an application, the first thing that comes is that what's the functional disposition of the application? What it's supposed to do and what it's not supposed to do. More importantly, what it is not supposed to do. Yeah, if you don't decide on that, the the issue that's going to happen is that the application is going to get bloated. Okay. And there are going to be a lot of issues across the life cycle. I mean, whether you're talking about testing or runtime, et cetera, et cetera. And we also get excited, you know, uh, coming up with a lot of integration patterns, you know, new patterns, whether you call it gRPC or, you know, REST-based or MQ or Kafka, da, da, da. Uh, but it does create a depth for us over a period of time to manage it, yeah? Then we also look at the application design. So this is where the application profile again comes in, right? I mean, uh, application design, how do you want to integrate with others? What kind of logic that you want to write within the application? What kind of logic you should not write? What is the logging framework? What is the DB integration framework with respect to Hibernate or you know, uh, whichever integration that we are talking about, right? Uh, the coding architecture, again, there needs to be some standards around it. Yeah, uh, uh, and I'll, I'll tell you how we are resolving it as well. Uh, uh, and then you have the data, security, testing, et cetera, et cetera, which you have tools like, you know, Sonacube or Veracode to actually measure the quality of the code, yeah? Then finally, problem with distributed system is that it is distributed because we need flexibility, right? But flexibility also comes with certain discipline and accountability. So we have seen systems that just goes down uh, with some of the latest tech stack. So assume that, uh, you know, I'm building an application that consumes a payment message using Kafka, okay? And then it needs to credit someone. Suddenly the Kafka cluster is down for some reason. What happens to the payment message? Correct. And today, uh, some of the programs, you know, that is written by the some of the developers, okay, it doesn't take care of exception processing because they think that their code is best. It happens. It happens. Yeah. So discipline and accountability, right? So there is something which is very important, and how we use DevOps to basically. Uh, enforce that on the developers as well, yeah. 
So we need to anchor DevOps a bit differently. Okay, so uh, if, if, you, if you go and ask any DevOps person what they do, they say they enable. Okay, they enable. They enable someone's life uh, with new tools that makes it simple for them to do something, right? But we need to go further ahead. Okay, the analogy that I provide is soccer. Uh, I love midfielders because they are the playmakers for me. Okay, not the goalkeepers or forwards. Yeah. So if we, if the DevOps team needs to be an influencer, there are different. Um, um, uh, domains that they need to split themselves with. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you are managers who manages DevOps team. Okay, you, all right. So I'm very sure that you'll be able to relate to this. Yeah, so the way we split across that, you know, there's an attacking midfielder who come up with prototypes, okay, uh, actually test something before you give it to the developers. And there are various aspects to measure that as well. Uh, one of the examples that I can give you is that um, obviously, yesterday Scott spoke about uh, developer portal, okay? But it's not about developer portal. Developer portal is just a window to the utilities. It is a framework behind the scenes. So what we did in our organization is that we created a framework called UFW, Universal Framework. Uh, it is pretty much like JHipster. It creates a starter project taking into account all the aspects of my organization because we have certain principles around logging, we have certain principles around how to integrate with MQ, uh, we have certain principles around um, um, uh, the, the API specifications, we have certain principles around the database. So it creates a start, starter project that the developers can pick up and it's kind of a hardened laptop within, within the constraints of which the developer can develop something. So for example, if I'm gonna use Redis for my application for some reason, there are some boundaries that we have set, okay? And those are the boundaries that the developers need to comply with, yeah? So that is something that our attacking midfielders do. And then I have a deep lying midfielder, that's why the standardization comes, because I also wanna measure what the attacking midfielders are doing, right? So the standardization part comes in over there, who's completely focused on uh, productivity and quality. So the, the whole framework that I was talking about comes under the quality aspect of it. Then I have the holding midfielder. They create the utilities. You know, they maintain the current tool sets because uh, today we maintain right from Jira till you know uh, deployment on OCP, Dada, et etc., et cetera, The whole deployment lifecycle. Okay, so they maintain all those uh, tool sets as well as maintenance. And then we have the defensive midfielder who looks at the security aspects of it as well as the quality testing quality aspects of it. So the uh, um, you call it platform engineering team, you call it whether it's DevOps team, doesn't matter. Because every organization is different, we use different terminologies. It's all about what, what, what we can do as a dev, uh, DevOps team. And there's a reason behind it, okay, which I'll show you as well, there's a reason behind it. Uh, DevOps team has so much data that none of the other teams have, and that too centralized. Okay, and uh, which, I'll, which I'll show you with an example later on. So net net, Turning from enabler to influencer, there are certain data tools that we need to use, there are certain standards that we need to define, and how to put the check again in the pipeline so that the development team complies with the standards, yeah? So again, taking an example, right? I mean, how many of you, you know, uh, I mean, I, I'm a big fan of NASA, ISRO, et cetera, et cetera, so I keep on following them, and I always drive an analogy of satellite launch vehicle and satellites. Okay, so DevOps team is basically a satellite launch vehicle. We take the payload from one place to another place. Okay, how far it is, it doesn't depend. The thing is that today, if you go and um, check any of this research organization or uh, launch vehicles, uh, you know, you'll see that the satellite design needs to comply with the launch vehicle. If they don't comply with the launch vehicle, they need to pay a premium to create a very different satellite, uh, satellite launch vehicle. Okay, there are some um, uh, engineering and design concepts that the satellite needs to comply with so that the satellite launch vehicle can actually carry it from Earth to any orbit that it wants, right? So I, I usually give this analogy to my team as well, saying that if you wanna have precision engineering, okay, you need to have standard pipelines and you need to be very clear that what the application needs to comply with, right? And same thing with respect to you know, what are the reusable components or waste components, because I wouldn't want to carry something that is not needed in production. So again, giving an example, right? Um, yesterday I did see that uh, there was one session on uh, schema as code, okay? So we introduced something called, you know, in, uh, uh, configuration as code, like three years ago. And it was a YAML file, you know, we use YAML-based uh, configuration to basically control 
a process microservice. So we don't want to make any changes to the process microservice. Rather, I can actually use the configuration in YAML to control that. In, in a period of one uh, or 18 months, I saw that the YAML file is bigger than the code by itself. Okay, And one single YAML file was controlling almost 15 microservices. What it means is that every time I change the YAML file, I need to test all my 15 microservices. You got it. So that, that's exactly where this thing comes in. Okay, How to put the restriction, looking at the size of the YAML file, and how to uh, bring in the principles to your developers. Some of, some of the developers are matured enough, but some of them, they just go with their own adventure, they put it across, including my own team and myself. Yeah. Consequence of failure. So the fail builds, obviously, today what happens whenever something fails, uh, the application team goes back, they look at it, fix it, and put it across. But we need to have a trend analysis around it, right? Why certain things are failing. Because some of the uh, issues could be the way the application has been designed, not about the developers. It's about the designers of the application themselves, yeah? So the, uh, since I, uh, I mentioned earlier, right, I mean, I have architecture, and then I have engineering, as well as I have DevOps. Um, usually, architects used to influence the DevOps team to what to use, etc. But I'm also reversing here in my team that the DevOps team actually influenced the architects to say that design your application based on these principles, since I'm not going to deploy it in production. Okay, it, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a challenge scenario, which is okay to have because that will sharpen the thought process. Yeah. So, all the concepts that I mentioned till now, what it has to do with concept to code to run. Okay. Uh, this, this is an interesting diagram that was put across by Dr. Dennis Koop, okay, and uh, he wrote a book called Driving Digital Transformation. Uh, he influenced me a lot in my thought process because five years ago, he was the CEO of uh, UOB Tomorrow. Yeah. Five years ago, I was like a raw developer and architect, but um, uh, under his guidance or in his thought process among other leaders, I, had, I could think abstract, okay, because what I, what I, there, there are three principles that I learned is that the best solution is the well-accepted solution. Okay, that is the first principle. Second principle is that every solution needs to have some value to it, else it's not a solution at all. And third one is that it has to be measurable. Okay, else we are just talking, we are just talking opinions. Yeah. So these are some three principles that I learned from many leaders, including uh, Mr. Dennis Koo. So this diagram was put by him. You need to read the book, it's much more deeper than this. Uh, so we have three stages, which is, product, service, and business model development. That is the first stage, which converts into a journey development, which converts into a development process. Um, so obviously, you know, most of, most of the organization will be following the concept of back-end for front-end. Okay? So over here is a pretty similar concept. But there are other scenarios where we develop front-end for back-end okay, due to certain reasons. If you go by this, the thought process is that how we can create multiple software assembly lines, how we can measure the KPS. So for that, we need to first define the KPS, okay? And then uh, mechanisms to remove waste, uh, and automated approaches for testing, and differentiated approaches for releases, okay? So obviously, when you talk about differentiated approaches for releases, you know, we just talk about blue-green deployment, da da da. You know, there are different mechanisms for that. But think in this way, if I'm going to deploy seven applications at the same time, because all these things are integrated with each other, for a particular feature to be launched in production, right? So there are certain complexities that comes with it. So anyone uh, who, who, who covers end-to-end -end DevOps paradigm can understand this. You know, I mean, uh, you have the conservation tools that you'll be supporting, probably Jira or Confluence, et cetera, over there. Then, um, uh, you know, Figma for journey design. And then you have the application design and coding, you know, IDE and development workspace, development standards, embedded via frameworks, and then you have a developer portal via which you expose all these utilities that the developers can use. Then API lifecycle, component catalog, configuration and infrastructure provisioning. And then you have the code quality analysis, DAS, SAS, you know, and then portfolio code quality insights, uh, build tools, you know, quality assurance, deployment, et cetera. So the, um, obviously we have started to implement certain AI tools uh, just to test it out, how it works, because um, how many of you have really implemented any AI tool in your pipeline? Not about linting, uh, okay? Leave the linting. Other than that, is there anything that you have implemented end-to-end -end for the context of your organization? 
Okay, I'm struggling right now. I'll be very honest with you. The reason for this is it's about the embeddings. So I'm using Langchain right now. Okay, and behind the scenes I have multiple models that is running in. Okay, Mistral is one of them. Also, I'm looking at Code Llama open source. But when I uh, look at the embeddings, it has to be very context specific, organization specific also. Yeah. So there are some struggles that I'm facing over there with respect to um, uh, test case generation, for example. Okay, we did test it. It works perfectly well for a greenfield project but there is still more improvements needed for a brownfield project. Okay, an old project that is 15 years old or 20 years old because we do have a mix of everything, right? Um, the message that I wanna pass over here is that the biggest investment or a good investment that I've done, the most useful one is the delivery lake, software delivery lake. So obviously we used uh, ELK, okay, to collect data right from the conceptualization till deployment across the tool sets. So what if I tell you that Based on a user story and mapping it to a commit ID, I can tell you what are the issues that particular user story has created. Okay, in reverse, for that particular user story, based on the commit ID, I can tell you what kind of code quality issues that it has created. Yep, I mean, you can call it value stream mapping or you know, value stream management, etc. But for me, for my organization, there are very different dashboards that we have created, which is uh, possible because of the lake that we have created and getting all the data across. So if you remember, there is one problem statement that I mentioned earlier, that one of the uh, stakeholders came and said that, can you give me a cheap solution, res resilient solution, scalable solution that can be delivered in three months? When I went back and saw what the problem was that, most of the time for the delays in the earlier projects was spent in grooming, okay? Which is between the, uh, the POs and the system analysts or developers, et cetera. They spend most of their time in grooming. It's not about development or testing the grooming itself. Then when we went back and uh, spoke to that particular stakeholder saying that, hey, you know what? Grooming is taking more time. Then we identified what's the issue with grooming. So there are a lot of unknowns with respect to the requirement or strategy itself, how we can fix it and move forward, correct? So that is the value that it brings in. So NetNet, -Net, this is my last slide. NetNet, -Net, the, the um, DevOps teams, you have so much data, okay, which you can use for multiple purposes across the life chain of the software delivery. Okay, to resolve issues as well as influence people okay, who are architects or POs or developers, et cetera. So that's it from my end. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much, Sri. Thank you.